Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the second book of Kings. A man came from Belshalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. He set it before them, they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias, a large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as many as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The scene became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, 
and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he wanted to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Christ. Well, as you can see, I'm not Heath, if you're looking in the bulletin. Sorry about that. We're, we're testing everybody to see if, if we say that Jason is preaching and Heath preaches, and if Heath preaches and I preaches, how many people show up. So, um, just kidding. There are a lot of events in the life of Jesus that are accounted for in all four Gospels, but today's reading is one of them, the feeding of the 5,000. It appears in all four Gospels, and so thus we read it every year of the lectionary. And this year, being year B, we're reading Mark, the shortest gospel. And so the lectionary takes this opportunity to take a, uh, read a piece of John's gospel. So we read this account from John's gospel instead of Mark's, um, like we've been reading throughout year B. And we're actually going to stay in John's gospel for the next four weeks in this same chapter. John chapter 6, right after the miracle, Jesus preaches a, a sermon that's going to get broken up and read throughout the next four weeks. And the chronology, though, is not interrupted because Jesus and his disciples are still doing ministry and John the Baptist has just been executed by Herod. And so Jesus and his disciples cross the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, to get away from Herod's territory. In crossing the sea, they leave Herod's realm and they, come, or, and they leave Jesus' home of Galilee. But their plan to get away, to lay low for a moment or to get some sabbatical rest, is foiled when they see a crowd following them. And John, the gospel writer, tells us that these crowds were following Jesus because of the miracles that he was doing for the sick. And so already Jesus is establishing his leadership uh, skills, his, his compassion for people. And in fact, other gospels note specifically that when Jesus saw the crowd approaching, he had compassion on them, like a like they were sheep without a shepherd, it says. And this is, again, a reference to the death of John the Baptist, who was their, just their former spiritual leader, and the failures of the sons of Herod, who are their supposed political leaders. So Jesus crosses the sea, the, the crowd follows him, and he sees that they are without food. And he asks his disciples, where are we going to get food for all these people? Again, in the other Gospels, it's actually the disciples that ask Jesus, where are we going to get food for everybody? And Jesus replies, oh, well, you feed them. As if they had, you know, food lying around for 5,000 people. So in both Gospels, the, in all the Gospels, there's this kind of sarcastic, even comedic right, reply from Jesus to the disciples about how they're going to feed the people. And it's because he wants to evoke them to have compassion and concern for the crowd as well. And so the, the disciples and Jesus gather the crowd and they um, have these five loaves and these two fish. And just as Moses fed his people in the desert with manna from heaven, Jesus then shows him to be, himself to be a prophet and feeds his followers with bread from heaven, you could say. And the people instantly recognize this and they call him a prophet, the prophet who is to come into the world, which is a reference to Moses' prophecy that one day there would be a prophet like him. And they are ready to crown him king. And not only is this surprising because Jesus is not the king, Herod is supposedly still the king of the region, and furthermore than that, anyone who would be declared a king without the consent of the Roman Senate or the Roman Caesar, more importantly, would be instantly sentenced to death by crucifixion. Those were just the laws. And so Jesus, as he often knows in John's gospel, slips away from the crowd and doesn't want to be, take this opportunity to be crowned, ki crowned king. He knows that the time has not come for him to take Rome head on. The fact that the crowds are even following Jesus at all is, should raise flags for us because they are supposed to be in Jerusalem. It's Passover. And so they're supposed to be gathered around the temple in Jerusalem, but instead they have gathered around Jesus in Galilee. Uh, 
this is definitely a reference to chapters earlier in John when Jesus told the Samaritan woman that a day was coming when people would no longer worship just on Mount Zion in Jerusalem or on Mount Gerizim in Samaria, but in spirit and truth. And now we see the fulfillment of this prophecy. And so Jesus slips away from the crowds, having fed them and having provided for them, and now they love him and they want to make him king, but he doesn't let them do so. And so I wonder in our lives what this might speak to. Where, in, where are we called to serve people and to provide for people, but then to not get caught up in it and to know when to call, to draw boundary lines and to know when to get away and get some rest for ourselves? Jesus obviously manages to slip away even from the disciples because they supposedly give up looking for him and sail back across the Sea of Galilee without him. And three to four miles out to sea, Jesus appears to them, and this startles them. They are, in fact, more afraid of Jesus than they are of the storm, and he calms their fears by saying, it is I. Now, in Greek, it's this phrase, it is I, is ego eimi, which is the divine phrase, I am. It's one of many times in John's Gospel where Jesus will say the phrase, I am. And so we see here that while the crowd saw Jesus correctly as a prophet and as a righteous king that they wanted, they didn't, he decides to show a deeper truth to his disciples in the walking on water, that he is more than that. He is the Lord over the waters. He's the great I am. He hasn't come just to make one more claim on authority next to Caesar or Herod. He's come to be the new creation that people need. And so why are these two miracles paired together? Why do we read the bread story and the water story? Well, no doubt it's for the reason that I just said, that the crowd see Jesus in one way, but Jesus wants his disciples to see him even deeper and have an even deeper relationship with him. And there's also the recalling, it reverses the story of the Exodus, where there's the parting of the Red Sea, the crossing of the sea, and then the feeding of the wil- in the wilderness. This reverses it. It feeds, Jesus feeds the crowds, and then crosses the sea. But there is also obviously a connection to showing Jesus as Lord over the waters and Lord over bread in the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist. And in fact, the word Eucharist was even used in our gospel passage today when Jesus had given thanks, that is Eucharist in Greek. And so for the next four weeks in John's gospel, we'll continue to talk about how Jesus views his body, how Jesus views the bread of life, and the implications that John saw for his first gospel readers. And so it's an opportunity to ask ourselves how we relate to these deeper mysteries. How do, what does it mean for us today that 2,000 years ago, they were already drawing connections between the idea of the Eucharist and the idea of feeding the hungry? Does it speak to the fact that we have billionaires racing to space while there's still people starving to death on Earth? Does it encourage us to have a mindset of abundance instead of a mindset of scarcity? I think it can reveal a lot of deeper truths for us if we're bold enough to let it. I think that Jesus becomes bread for us so that we might become bread for others. Amen. Let us affirm our faith by saying together, we believe in God.
Let us pray. Father of all mercies, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, we offer you our prayers and thanksgivings, responding, hear our prayer. Keeper of the kingdom, show us how to reveal its riches to those who are spiritually hungry or who put their trust in false gods. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Giver of bread and daily sustenance, send us into your creation, proclaiming the good news of salvation, bearing witness to a life of gratitude and generosity. Lord, in your mercy, source of hope, remain with us through the trials of daily life and encompass us with the fullness of your love. Lord, in your mercy, God of glory and power, make us ever thankful that you have given us a share in the building of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, bread to the world, give us courage and faith to feed others in your name, to reach out in your love, to rejoice in the abundance of your grace, and to become nourishment to all. Lord, in your mercy. <coughs> Risen Christ, be with those who have passed away through this temporal life, that they may find rest in the company of angels, archangels, saints, and all the company of heaven. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Enfold in the one who opens the door of life and calls us friends. We continue our prayers either silently or aloud. God's grace be with all on this lovely day, and I want to begin the announcements by saying I apologize to those who want to be outside. We made a judgment call, and it's my call to be inside, thinking it was actually too hot and humid. So some approve, I know some don't. There is no pleasing everybody, so if you're angry, be angry at me, and my apologies. Um, and I'm sorry, it's also, I've turned the air conditioning a little bit warmer, so I hope it's not too chilly for too many. Um, but welcome to all, and especially welcome to guests and visitors uh, who are here with us today. Uh, there are just a couple of quick announcements I wanted, as always, to, uh, to mention. Uh, the first is that we are about to be blessed by Becca Daly, offering her gorgeous voice uh, in a song by Gabrielle Faure. So thank you for being here 
today, Becca. I also wanted to um, remind everybody that we will have communion at both corners, if you will, of the nave. So simply exit the, the, I'm sorry, the side aisle, come up and receive communion, and then back down the center. So we will be um, right up here at the front left and right. Also, uh, please note the new announcement in the bulletin about the Paris picnic that's going to be starting, uh, taking place in five weeks. Many of you know that normally we do the picnic in June and the ice cream social in uh, late August. This year we flipped the pattern. And so we're going to have the parish picnic on August 29th, outdoor Eucharist on the North Lawn at 10 o'clock. Uh, and as always, we're going to have a particular theme to the music uh, this year. It's going to be love songs through the decades, one song from each of the last several decades, back to about the 1950s. And the theme is, what's love got to do with it? Uh, the Tina Turner song. Uh, that seems to connect quite well to the gospel because we often have to ask, what's love got to do with it, got to do with it? Anyway, so I hope you will join us on the 29th, but also please note that we're going to do the same kind of picnic we did a couple years ago, wherein the church will buy the burgers and the dogs, and if you can volunteer to help flip those, that would be great. But we're asking people to bring a side dish or a dessert to share with others. Uh, please call Laurel in the front office and let her know if you can bring either of those items. Um, and if you can't, just come and chow down anyway. Uh, so it's going to be a wonderful day, August 29th. We will also bless the backpacks. Uh, school will have just begun or will be about to begin for all of our students. More information as it unfolds, but please put it down in your calendars now. Any other announcements I need to make or should... If not, then walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
continue with the Eucharistic prayer, I realized I forgot probably the single most important announcement. And that is that the donuts will be in the parlor <laughs> after the liturgy. So please go there for coffee hour. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Honor and worship are indeed your due, our Lord and our God, through Jesus Christ. For you created all things. By your will they were created, and for your glory they have their being. In your loving purpose, you chose us before the foundations of the world to be your people. You gave your promises to Abraham and Sarah and bestowed your favor on the Virgin Mary. In your Son, you suffered with us and for us, offering us the healing riches of salvation and calling us to freedom and holiness. Therefore, with people of every nation, tribe, and language, with the whole church on earth and in heaven, Joyfully we give you thanks and sing. Before he died, our Lord Jesus gathered with his friends and took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup. And when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you do this, do this to remember me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, in the sacrament of the suffering and death of your Son, we now celebrate the wonder of your grace as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit, that these gifts of bread and wine, which we now receive, may be to us the body and blood of Christ, and that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. Redeemer God, rich in mercy, infinite in goodness, we were far off until you brought us near, and our hands are empty until you fill them. As we eat this bread and drink this wine, through the power of your Holy Spirit, feed us with your heavenly food, renew us in your service, unite us in Christ, and bring us to your everlasting kingdom. Blessing, honor, and glory be yours now and everywhere, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to the rest of you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. And now, praying with those who are worshiping with us virtually this morning, let us say together the prayer of spiritual communion on the bottom of page 11. My loving Lord, of God, for the people of God.
on page 12. Let us pray. no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve the Lord. And the blessed God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.